So I don't know a world-class lifter who's not missing lifts during training. It's part of the program. And so we want to get them comfortable with that so that we can add more speed and eventually add more load. Episode 34, we're back. You ready to rock? Let's get it, baby. Yeah, listen, so I had this idea about this podcast uh, yesterday when we were going over uh, double unders, and I just recognized that there are just some movements that some people struggle with more often than not. And so today's a perfect way. We came up with a list of five most notorious CrossFit movements that people just struggle with on average, and we're going to explain why we think that is and how we get people to try to move a little bit better in these in these ways yeah it's safe to say these movements take a decent amount of skill and they're movements that are in crossfit that you won't normally see in your traditional uh training program you know a lot of newbies that will come in here for the first time in our first class once they see these skills these movements might be a little intimidating at first because they look a little more challenging, but there's always ways to scale them, and that's kind of what we're gonna go over today. Yeah, what we're finding is if you have um, some experience in weightlifting or gymnastics, there's some of these notorious movements that are difficult for some people, but not for you, and vice versa. If you are a uh, runner, you can come in here and the conditioning work is uh, pretty easy for you. You can do that, Will, but when it comes to the nuances and complexity of some of these other movements, you struggle with big time. For instance, people have never touched a bar until they come into our facility. They struggle. People that have never done gymnastic style calisthenic movements like pull-ups and handstands, mm -hmm. they are going to struggle. So we wanna acknowledge what their current experience is. We wanna create an assessment, quick assessment tool we can do on the floor, on the fly, to see what their current level of uh, skill is without hurting them, and then getting them to that magic uh, movement or modification, if you will, to get them where they need to be today to eventually get to some of those more complex, harder movements down the road. Yeah, then, and not just stopping there, if you have a previous strength experience or cardio experience, um, you know, that can aid in your, you know, be set up for success with these movements. But if you lack some type of coordination or stringing these things together, uh, that can show as well. So it's kind of, that's what the beauty of this, these high skilled, difficult movements is. It takes strength, it takes conditioning, it takes coordination, balance, you know, all the physical skills we talk about in CrossFit put together to achieve these movements. I agree hundred percent. So the first one, uh, we've kind of uh, uh, implied it here. It's going to be uh, Olympic lifting, not power lifts, not, uh, you know, we're not talking back squats, deadlifts, bench. We're talking the Olympic movements and their derivatives, the snatch, the clean and jerk, the push jerk, the push press, the power cleans, those wide grip high pulls, any of those derivatives. We just find people who don't have experience with these lifts struggle. Yeah, they look at it right away and they're like, holy smokes, like what what did you just do? You know, you got the barbell flying from the floor all the way up to overhead with your arms locked out to the point where once they do try that they're like oh my god it feels awkward right it's not awkward you just don't understand the comp uh, complexity of the movement just yet so then it's our job as coaches to try to simplify this to try to get them close to the movement as possible uh their first day yeah and that's why you know us using olympic lifting week with uh with barbell complex is one of the quickest way to get people moving and getting comfortable but I think, yeah, the first one is just lack of experience. They have not put their hands on the bar enough times to be really good at it. So they make it awkward when it really shouldn't. This is just some real natural motions. Uh, number two, the one I find most often with men is their lack of range of motion, their freedom at the joint. They just don't have it, whether it's at the shoulder, at the knee, the hip, the ankle. There's a limiting factor, one or more, that's causing a major struggle with the bar. Yeah, we see it so many time and time again. You got someone that'll walk in here that's got a 500 pound deadlift, but they can't overhead squat more than 95 pounds, right? It's not a strength issue here, it's a mobility issue. Um, and if we can kind of get these people to notice, hey, let's put the strength part away a little bit, let's focus on mobility. Uh, what'd you say yesterday? Go ahead and, and bring that quote back on, you would prefer someone 
that is a little bit weaker that has great mobility over someone that has tremendous strength um, with weak mobility. Yeah, well, we're, what we know physiologically, it's much better to adapt to strength to get somebody stronger than it is to get somebody who's immobile, mobile again. And I will take somebody who's mobile and lacks the strength because for novice individuals, we know that there's exponential growth in strength. They can get strong fast, mm -hmm. right? Where I pray for a 20 pound deadlift PR, we can get novice athletes 50 to 100 pounds in six months. So what we want to recognize is that the flexibility takes a lot longer to improve. It's also really boring and mundane. Exactly. For, I was just going to say, it's not for, as fun, right? It's not as fun. It's not as sexy. But because they're neglecting that, they're not able to do the fun, sexy stuff and do it well. And so they're compromising all the time. So we really just need to be open and honest with these individuals about what we call limiting factors. Hey, do you know that this rack position is a limiting factor for anything you do overhead? Because that art type, right, that uh, something we discussed as being a position that you find most common in other movements, one of the common archetypes is going to be those biceps to here, wrist over shoulders. That's a common pressing finish, mm -hmm. whether you're upside down or uh, right side up. And those guys need to be able to move and fr do that freely without exhaustion, and they just can't right now. Yeah, it just comes down to kind of prioritizing on your biggest weaknesses and attacking those even if it's not fun even if it's not sexy you know if you can if you're showing up early okay to the gym and you've got mobility restrictions in a front rack but you're doing heavy deadlifts before group class starts it's kind of you're kind of missing the point on what you should be working on versus you know what because you know let's face it it's fun to work on our strengths right mm -hmm. and it sucks to work on our weaknesses right when you see something on the board you don't want to necessarily do because that is a weakness for you like oh damn we're doing that today chances are those are what you need to work on the most of course I, I told you what my inside joke is is that when someone says they like to work out what they basically said is I like those movements because I'm good at it and when they said I didn't like that workout what they really said is this didn't do it for me because these movements are not in my wheelhouse mm -hmm. and so I take that very sensitive to mean hey like when they say that I have to really help redirect their point of view on this workout because there's no such thing as one perfect workout and they need to understand where this workout fits within the general compass of our cycles and our months and our years put together. So uh, yeah, that's a, a really interesting point. But I think for females, we have an opposite issue. They are tend to be a lot more mobile, though they lack the strength, I agree. Uh, full absolute strength. They have not even come close to tapping full potential. For women in Olympic lifting, it's, pu it's a pure issue of fear. They are very sweet women. They mm -hmm. uh, they aggressive and force and power and uh, don't fit within their psyche. So they don't get bulky either. Right? Yeah, they have. <laughs> well, yeah. So they're they're always timid in weight, but they're uh -huh. timid in speed, Brett. And they what I say is that ninety percent of all errors in Olympic lifting can, can get fixed with more speed. Right, mm -hmm. they're, they're just doing it slow. They're segmenting the lift when it should be continuous motion. They're overthinking it. They're overthinking it. So we want to get them to be faster and help them understand how that will transition into being in a better Olympic lifter. But you have to break some of that with like, hey, you're not going to crack your head to teach him bailing mechanisms. Yep. And three, and that it's completely safe to fail. I don't know a world-class lifter who's not missing lifts during training. It's part of the program. And so we want to get him comfortable with that so that we can add more speed and eventually add more load. No, I've heard you say that before, and I've used that as a cue uh, plenty of times in group class. Well, I'll see an athlete, you know, break this one lift into three diff different parts and segments. And also, hey, let's do that a little bit faster. You know, you're kind of breaking it down in all these parts. Go a little bit faster, they'll string them all together and it looks a thousand times better. Speed fixes everything. And your other point about strength, I think that the, the reply to a client, a female client is, this is heavy enough. But when we look at it, it's done really fast, effortlessly and with immaculate form. Those three variables for me mean it's too light still. I didn't see a struggle. I didn't see them having to overthink it. 
and uh, because of those reasons, I want them to play with a little bit more load, and especially during breakout session, because breakout session, there's no risk. Nobody's moving fast. Nobody's forced to add more than one movement at a time. This is all we're working on. Let's test it now to realize maybe it's too heavy for the workout and we can back back off. Mm -hmm. But don't, let's not guess that. Let's know for sure 110%. Yeah, that's why we give that time you know, before a conditioning piece. Hey, you got five, 10 minutes to find a load. Uh, do some reps, make sure it feels right before you even, you know, start the timer. I love it. So Olympic lifting, what's the number two? Uh, pull up, pull up. Ooh, uh, that's a good one. Yeah, and a lot of, a big misconception is where people say, hey, I don't have the strength to pull myself up to the bar, when in reality, chances are you're too heavy in regards to your body weight. Yeah, we, we want to be open and honest with our clients that... That's a tough conversation to have sometimes, though. It's a tough, and I think you got you to gotta, uh, empathize with them, put yourself in their shoes and how they feel. One is you want to create an environment that when you do say that, you're saying that out of, uh, out of a coach who really cares, and two, that they don't feel like they're ever being embarrassed. So we would never say that out loud, mm -hmm. hey, don't do that, you're too heavy, right? We would have to Never. have those side conversations or uh, conversations after class to say, what I truly think would be a game changer for you is that if we, if, if we worked on uh, getting you to lose more weight, mm -hmm. are, you, are you still happy with where your weight is at? And that really is a, just a nice transition to the real issue to all this, which is they still need to lose weight. They're not even in our fitness category for body composition. And so we want to redirect that conversation for them because there's no amount of straight work strength work that's going to help you if you're 30 percent body fat and so we really want to just be honest with them uh, because we we're not going to put three bands on a bar we are not going to get people to do 100 jumping pull-ups we're not going to do that stuff because it hasn't really fixed the real issue which is they don't have appropriate strength to body weight ratio the strength might be there but not for the weight that they're at yeah one of my go-to's is i'll do a self-comparison hey when i'm at my lightest weight my push-ups handstand push-ups uh pull-ups they string together so much better you know um it's just it's not rocket science if you're lighter you're gonna move faster you're gonna move better and all the gymnastic movements will string together so much more when you're a little bit lighter, a little bit leaner. So let's try to get you there, right? I'll just go back to comparing myself. When we go back to demoing athletes, right? We wanna use athletes that are superb and do that well. And when you find an athlete who knows does it well, on average, they're the leaner, most uh, advanced athlete. So you look at him, you're like, okay, that is a model, right? For what this should look like for the movement quality and, and the, the body composition, the look there. Oh, of course they can do 10, uh, 10 kipping pull-ups, they have 12% body fat. And mm -hmm. so we want to start making that connection there of why they do that so well. I think the other one too, Brett, that's hard with a program like ours, and it's why we've implemented Skill of the Week to improve movements like the pull-up as well, is there's not enough linear progression, right? We come out of personal training, which was like Monday was chest. And every Monday, we were going to add a progressive overload to that. We're going to go five by five on this way. We'll hit that for four weeks. Then we move to four by eight and we hit that. And then so we are keep advancing load. Well, we don't have that convenience here because our commitment and promise is also the most difficult part about a program. And that's we're changing, our making original, unique workouts every single day, week, month, and year that they come here. So we can't add as advanced linear progression, even if we said we were going to on the same day. And the reason we don't do that is because we can make there are individuals that only come to our facility on Tuesday and Thursday and Saturday. So if I'm only doing linear progression for pull-ups on Monday, those people They're will never it tap it no matter mm -hmm. what. And so it makes this program really difficult to master movements long term. It keeps it fun and exciting because we're changing workouts. But uh, there has to be an emphasis and placement on individuals adding other things to their program. We are more than open right to help individuals get them there we'll send them protocols we'll tell them what to do before or after the workout but at the end of the day it's up to them to show up early stay after class and work on that on their own i can't lift them up on the pull-up bar myself they have to put in that work yeah no i agree i agree that kind of comes back to the previous point is just prioritizing on working on your weaknesses on your own before class after class and sticking to it doing it consistent enough to where you start to see results getting better at that movement and I think it's just being honest with yourself if you're on the same band a year later I would I would highly uh, I would highly look at whether what you're doing is working mm -hmm. because if we're looking for improvement and you're still doing the same amount of reps with the same band you're not improving they're comfortable you know it comes down to them being comfortable uh, 
you know, they got to challenge themselves. We got to challenge them. Hey, let's ditch that band or go to a lighter band. And, uh, you know, instead of doing a set of 10, let's go two sets of five with a little bit of break in between with a lighter band. Yeah, I mean, we implemented the one band policy last year. It's been the best thing for us. Uh, a new client comes in. Uh, they're not sure if they can do pull-ups. We pull out one band. They can't do it. We don't add another band. Mm -hmm. we, we, as coaches, say, okay, the band doesn't work for them. Then we go ring rolls or bicep curls every single time because the truth of the matter is they're still not strong enough and they're probably still overweight. Their body fat is still too high to be able to overcompensate for that lack of strength. So we're just that, that's the protocol. I can't do strict pull-ups. I try with one band. I can't do that. I go ring rows. If ring rows is not sufficient to match the stimulus for the workout, they might do quick jumping pull-ups, which is rare, or they're going to go bicep curls. That's mm -hmm. it. That's yep. the protocol. It's smooth as quick. It takes less than two minutes, and everybody knows. But we're also asked coaching, asking, hey, man, you're making that band look easy, right? Let's say it's the blue, although these bands aren't universal. Let's say it's the blue band. Hey, let's go to the red band. It's a little bit lighter. Let's see how you work. So instead of getting five easily, they get four with struggle. Well, great. We got a lighter band now, but you're only doing four. Now your sets turn into sets of four as you strategize these workouts. But they're doing more with their own body than letting some external factor like the band do it for them. Yeah, and I always say, hey, let's give up time and, you know, these other facets of the workout and let's get better at these. You know, uh, last week, I think we had a pull-up running type workout. This female was a great runner, okay? She was struggling with her pull-ups. Um, not struggling with her pull-ups, but she was, she had too much resistance of a band she was using, right? Okay. So I was like, hey, let's ditch the band. You'll make up time on the run and let's try to get a little bit stronger. Easy enough, work perfect. Yeah, and that's, again, the responsibility of athlete and coach to sit back and say, okay, what's the goal here? We know your strength is a run. Let's give up you losing a little time on the pull-up, but to do it a little bit harder, mm -hmm. right? And that just met her, right? It didn't, like, defeat her purely by getting stuck to one kipping pull-up at a time, but we, she felt like she was still getting best of both worlds there. Yeah, and exactly. that, that's, I would have done the same. Great job. Um, number three, what would be the third most notorious movement? Uh, I think we can go easy transition from pull up to another gymnastic movement and go over the handstand push up. Yes, 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 yes. And ironically, uh, it, a lot of these uh, issues we had with the pull up are the same issues we're going to have with the handstand. Number one, strength to body weight ratio. Mm -hmm. You're stacking overweight people on their shoulders. Of course, they're gonna be uncomfortable and fearful getting upside down. So we have to recognize, do they even have the base strength to even attempt to kick up? That's number one. And if you're not sure, then you have to have regressions, tools of the toolbox, in your belt to be able to get that to them quickly. For me, mine's easy. I'm gonna get those individuals who lack strength to body weight ratio a wall walk. I want them, hey, I want you to do this. I want you Mind to bear well. crawl backwards up to the wall and just sit there for 15 seconds. I know within 15 seconds whether how, how well they hold that, whether they're ready to kick up or not. If they're shaking and dancing, they can barely walk up to the wall, that's all they're doing today. Mm -hmm. Regardless whether it's kipping handstand push up or handstand, we're not doing anything else today because they need to build that base right. Yeah, and then a wall walk's a perfect progression because they choose how close they want to get to the wall, which is choosing how much of their body weight is used as resistance when they're holding themselves upside down. So it's a, hey, um, and ex especially good for people that have never been upside down, right? A, they're probably a little bit heavy, and B, they've never been upside down. So it's, hey, today, let's, so not only are you testing their strength, but testing, hey, go as far as you can towards the wall as you feel comfortable. Exactly, and then we're trying to get them slowly to walk in closer and closer. There we can do some stuff where you can even do some modified handstands on the box, piped up. So yeah, uh, but that's where the, the, they need to do that with ease and comfortability. Until they can do that, you no shouldn't be giving them. kicking upside down. Yeah, man, you're, you're doing more harm than good for them. The other one that we, we notice with them is maybe they show strength and effortlessness uh there, and they're ready to kick up, and they immediately say, I'm afraid, right? Yep. And rightfully so. So there needs to be a protocol or a way that you teach coaches how we are going to spot individuals who are attempting to kick up for the first time. They've proven base strength through 30, 60 second wall walk holds, and now it's time to get them to kick up. And so we have a mechanism for how we teach coaches to tell athletes how to kick up, how the coach is gonna uh, spot them at the thigh to unload their body weight by 10 to 15%, and they're gonna hold them there and do nothing else. And we'll look for those attempts. And that might be attempt of the handstand hold might be 
the skill and focus for that individual that day. Yeah, yeah, they're just gaining more and more confidence each every attempt they try to kick up, even if they're missing those attempts. Like, hey, I'm getting closer, I'm getting closer, I'm getting closer, and the, us as coach are encouraging them, hey, you're right there, just throw those hips a little bit more. You know, one of my go-tos on kind of keeping them comfortable is, hey, this wall is not going anywhere, yeah, right? Yeah. You are not gonna fall forward, this wall is Commit here. Yourself. You, you know, so kick up with confidence. The wall's not gonna be there, I'm here. Let's just get you upside down, and chances are if you can get them upside down, like, that fear kinda goes away. Yeah, for sure, and ab mat, yoga mats, anything to just give them self-confidence uh, that if they do come down, they'll, they'll, the, you have an, uh, a mat there to save you. So, uh, yeah, that, that's another concern. I think the other one that comes up too is the same thing with the pull-up. Like, if we're only doing handstands once a week, which is where it comes out to in our programming, and you don't come that following week on the day we do handstands, it can be weeks before you touch it mm -hmm. or work on it. So you're either building this through linear strength. By the way, gymnastics movements can't be built up in the same rep schemes as regular barbell strength. Five by five back squat. You want the most simplest, most effective training program for all barbell strength, do a five by five program. Likewise, the truth is the same for body weight exercises. Find a modification that will allow you to move through range of motion through five handstand push-ups. Whether it's two ab mats, whether it's on the box, or uh, some other derivative like that. Do a five by five, as that gets easier, you increase the difficulty by increasing the range of motion. And that's how we develop the strength. And so for these individuals, if they're not placing a priority by putting that in, no matter, no matter what, regardless of the programming, before a workout, after a workout, they will never get good at it or not fast enough in which they think they should be getting better at it. And so that's where, you know, you'll hear that frustration from clients because they're not getting, they, they thought they were gonna have pull-ups by now. They thought they were gonna have handstand push-ups now. Then you start asking them, well, what have you done to get better at these things? Mm -hmm. And they have no direction. And so I think as the coaches, our job to provide direction, but it's their job to get the job done. To execute. To execute, the mm -hmm. action, right? And uh, that, that uh, ironically holds the same features as handstand push-ups. Yeah, I feel like if you haven't established a weakness that you are working on either every day or worst case scenario every other day you don't care enough about that to get results and to get better at that weakness i agree i agree i agree man and uh it goes back to the, our hardest job is communication is what we know is fact but how do we do it in a loving and empowering way all right and uh that's life no matter what job you have no matter what situation whether it's a discussion between me and my wife and there's something I got to tell her that is truthful, but I got to do it in a way that still builds us up. That's not like, yeah, I threw it in your face because I knew I was right, but it, you know, that's a win-lose. We want a win-win for everybody. I agree. Uh, the other movement that comes to mind that's just notoriously hard that most people just don't recognize, they just think they suck at it, is running. It's not that I'm bad at running, I just hate doing it, but I recognize it's only for two reasons. My technique needs a lot of work. It needs a tremendous amount of work. And two, I just don't practice it enough. I don't put it in. The, the, the most mileage I'm gonna get in on a good week is a mile to two miles and it's built in in a CrossFit workout. You are not going to build endurance work. You're not gonna become a better runner by just doing CrossFit. You have to get on the pavement and start running. LSD, long, slow distance. You gotta keep a low, slow, heart rate and you need to maintain that for 20 to 30 minutes at a time unbroken that's how runners get better for a reason running a mile in a 20 minute amrap is not going to make you a better runner long term it's not going to get you to improve your 5k 10k 10k time trials you have to get the mileage in on in in those feet yeah and i think uh a lot of people lack in the running technique is because they don't believe it takes much technique to be a good runner as it is. You know, it's not something you can kind of try to look at and dial in, um, you know, thinking about comparison to a back squat or a deadlift. Hey, deadlift, we know, keep your back flat, um, drive through your legs, use your hips. But running, it's more, some people kind of misconstrue. It's like, hey, I'm just moving from point A to point B and I'm going as fast as I can, right? Uh, little do they know, it's definitely more technique uh, than, than we give it credit to. Uh, the couch to 5K has been the worst thing for the, the sport of running. 
uh, excuse me, for the technique of running. For the sport, it's been amazing. More people are running 5Ks more than ever, but more people than ever are also injuring themselves running more than ever. And that's not running any more than that people behind the wheels cause accidents. No one says cars are bad. They say, oh, that dude behind the wheel is a dumbass, right? Yep. The same thing is true here. And that's, you can get, your body is freaking resilient. It can manage a lot of crap for a really long time. So by the time you actually get hurt, you know how much has gone in and how much uh, mechanical error has gone into busting your shins, getting plantar fasciitis, getting hip issues, straining a hamstring. It's gone through wear and tear of bad running mechanics. There is a scale of running. The best runners in the world do it naturally. And all we're trying to do is mechanize that running protocol into, uh, there's a couple uh, trademarks for the, uh, the style of running that we believe in, but the most popular is an acronym called POSE Running, P-O-S-E. And that is the uh, way that we believe the world's best runners should run. And uh, CrossFit has done a really good job uh, being a proponent of that style of running. And we have brought that style of running here. And uh, it's worked wonders for the people that have caught on who have tried to work on that technique. Yeah, it's getting people better. You know, it's kind of, you know, this pose running is bringing awareness awareness on, hey, you got to better your technique. So let's focus on that, right? Instead of just continuous to run with poor uh, technique. Well, I say treat the run like a deadlift. And you would, you know, if you're smart and you're an informed consumer, that you would never lift heavy weight until you were taught how to lift heavy weight. Mm -hmm. And the same true has to be held about the ideology of where running stands within that. It is a movement, it is complex. Uh, and it is difficult to perform well, so you need to be coached and taught how to run, and that's never happened to anybody. Nobody can truly say, the average of people, that they actually had a coach that taught them how to run. Yep, I'll admit firsthand, I never was ever told to, or taught how to run until I started doing CrossFit. Exactly, and I, listen, I ran cross country in high school, and uh, I never got taught how to run. We did intervals, and we did long, slow distance. That's what we did, mm -hmm. and they we got better not at running, we got we got better condition. I'm not necessarily sure that my technique got better. When I got into CrossFit and I got certified for pose running, it was it just made sense that this this is how the world class runners run, and I'm just trying to do that a little bit well. Uh, and it, and it's worked runners for me because I've taken it as a purist. It's a movement like anything else, and I need to work on it to get better. Mm -hmm. Uh, what's the last one? The last one, Brett. Where, what, what is it, the most notorious movement that most people are struggling with in, in CrossFit? Uh, double unders. Taking the jump rope, spinning it two times around with one jump. And uh, this one is, is a good one because literally to put it most plain and simple, to get better is to do it more, right? Do more jump rope. Like that all, all there is to it. Um, we can go over, you know, minor technique fixes here and there. But a coach can give the best cue in the entire world. But until you start applying, grabbing the jump rope and doing it, you'll never get better. It's such a high skill and something that people have not done for decades, if not a half a century, going 50 years without touching a jump rope. You just need to get to practice. There are some slight mechanics that will build that technique faster and keep you healthier longer, but really it's about grabbing the rope. And people won't touch that rope unless we tell them to. And that's unfortunate because the ropes are there, they should use it. I think it's a great warm up tool. You get the calves lit, quads lit, the heart rate's going up, you're sweating, working your coordination. It's a great warm up tool, but a lot of people just don't like to use it. And because it's a high brain skill, then you add something the, like the double under, which is two rotations per jump, and you add it under duress, man, that thing looks so ugly sometimes, it's unbelievable more people aren't getting hurt from it. And again, though the body is resilient, eventually that's gonna catch up. The other reason it catches up in frustration. People mm -hmm. just like, they, they break down on the double under workout, or they choose the single under over convenience. But we want to argue that they are two different monsters. Doing single unders are a completely different monster than double under. And if you're okay doing single unders, I would highly question what you think the role of the single under and double under are. Because if the end goal is complexity of movement, then the double under is what we should be shooting for. And um, I think the other issue is that there's inconsistency with rope sizing. Rope sizing, it's huge. It'd be like not understanding rope sizing is like 
going into your wife's closet and wearing whatever high heels she has in there. It's ludicrous. It doesn't match who you are. It doesn't match your body type. And that's why people need to understand how to size rope or how to grab a rope that's sized to them completely. Because the size of the rope predicates the speed of the rotation and the height of the jump. Mm -hmm. The rope does that. And if you keep grabbing different ropes and you're like, oh, jump roping stupid. Or even weights too. Or uh, the load of it, yep. exactly. So uh, we, we wanna make that clear how to do that. And the best way to do that is consistency through your own rope. Yeah, that's If you don't have 15 to $20 to spend for your own rope, I can't help you. Mm -hmm. I can't help you. Cause it's one of those things like you can carry on everywhere, you can use anywhere, but really it's just a will. Where there's a will, there's a way. They'll take that with them. You know, nothing makes me happier when someone walks in or tells us with they bought their, their own rope. Yep. Woo! Mm -hmm. They got their pink color. They it's might even fired got up. Their, oh, Man, yeah. they're fired. They got a little tote bag with yeah. it. Like, because I'm like, okay, oh shit. They mean business. They're, they're getting it. Yeah. They're getting it. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're trying to sell, whether it's the double under or any of the other movements that we talked about today. Yeah, no, the, the own rope is huge, you know. Uh, I just kind of can compare it to when I played baseball back in high school. I went up to bat with my bat every single time, right? I was like, hey, can I use yours? Can I use that? Like all different shapes and sizes. Um, when you're trying to really, really master a skill that involves a piece of equipment, like that's got to be your piece of equipment. That's got to be your go-to. So you kinda, you're kind of eliminating a possible outcome of a different type of equipment setting you back when you're trying to develop this skill. I agree, man. And um, hopefully we've sold that for, for a lot of these movements. Some people will even have their own barbells. I think that's crazy. You're like, like they have a preference of barbell, right? Because yeah. they know what works for them. But they recognize that that the, the uh, equipment is important as well. And I mean, I'm they, not gonna lie. I race for the rope barbell every knows. single time. Everybody knows. <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, everybody knows. Are there special pull up bar for the? You know what I mean? Oh, no, you want to know if something was funny? So we use the uh, one ab mat rule for. Um, Ashley told me this the other day. The one ab mat rule for handstands, right? If you can't, uh, or excuse me, two ab mats. If you yeah. can't do it with two, then you can't do handstand push ups. With, let's go through a different modification. Well, this client was telling Ashley the other day that she hustled the system because she found ab mats uh, that, that were bigger, thicker yeah. than other. I'm like, oh, she's hustling come us, on, bro. Come on. She's hustling. So she takes the two fattest mats. Yep. So it gives her like two extra inches. So I was like, oh my gosh, our members are hustling us. I know exactly what but you're talking about. It goes too. exactly. They understand that the equipment has a, a huge control over uh, and predicts the consistency and quality of their movements. So. And then just one more point on the double enders. Don't. Don't worry about messing up or tripping up. Like, don't get embarrassed. You really gotta, you know, fail numerous of times sometimes to really, you know, develop a skill, get somewhere. Um, so don't worry about you tripping up in front of a coach or a classmate. Uh, we don't care. Just, you know, keep continuing to work on it and it'll get better. I'll take somebody doing double under attempts any day in a workout than someone hanging out without any effort doing singles. Mm -hmm. And that's what kills me because really, the, the goal is the doubles, right? And if you're not even attempting them, you've already given up. Mm -hmm. You've already given up, and that, that hurts me. It's not the issue of the double under, it's that you've already given up trying to get better at a certain movement. Yeah, it takes a different type of mental toughness to continue to go over, you know, work on double unders when you've tripped up five, 10 times, you know. Stay, you know, stay calm, stay focused, work on what you're doing, and, uh, and don't get frustrated. Yeah, I mean, I think if we can leave this all to everything, it's without struggle, there is no growth. Like that's why they're notoriously hard. The obstacle is the way. Mm -hmm. Get through it, love work it. through it, let it click until it becomes natural. Yeah, love it, man. Thank you guys, we appreciate you. We'll see you next week. Catch you next time. Bye.